This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring Lake Forest College head coach Jim Catanzaro. In this episode, Coach Catanzaro details the value of recruiting multi-sport athletes out of high school, highlights his personal coaching philosophy, and shares the impact that the transfer portal has had at the Division III level. But first, a word from our partner. The All-State AFCA Good Works team has been one of the most esteemed honors in college football for more than 30 years. The student-athletes who are nominated for this award demonstrate a unique dedication to community service and desire to make a positive impact on the world around them. The Good Works team is comprised of 11 players from the FBS and 11 players from the FCS, Division II, III, and NAIA, as well as one honorary head coach. To be in consideration by Allstate and the AFCA for a nomination, each player must be actively involved with the charitable organization or service group while maintaining a strong academic standing. Past Good Works team members include notable players such as Peyton and Eli Manning, Tim Tebow, Trevor Lawrence, and Nicobe Dean. Coaches, do you have a player that you think embodies the values of a Good Works team? Be sure to connect with your SID to discuss potential nominees. Nomination forms have been sent out for the 2022 AFC Assistant Coach of the Year Award. To be eligible for this honor, a candidate must be an assistant coach at a four-year collegiate institution, have joined or renewed AFCA membership prior to the start of the 2022 football season, coach in a program that is not on major NCAA, NAIA, or conference probation, and make outstanding contributions in the area of community service, professional organization involvement, and student-athlete development, both on and off the field. Coach, what's happening? What's going on? Oh, it's great, man. Just out here at the board trustee meetings having uh, your boss be my boss. So it's been a good good week. <laughs> well, hopefully he's treating you guys well out there in Arizona, and we, we definitely appreciate you being a part of uh, making our organization great. And, uh, man, I'm super excited about this podcast because – Late last night, I, I was watching some playoff basketball games and just whipped my phone out and, and started scrolling through your bio and uh, and ran across something that, that just blew my mind. So, you know, we talk about multi-sport athletes in high school, but uh, you very rarely see multi-sport athletes in college. I know every probably probably each one of us might have one or two guys on our team that were, you know, special, <laughs> you know, and they were able to go play basketball, you know, and and, and be a little bit, you know, have a little role on, on, on some other sports, but not only were you a multi-sport athlete, you were a four-sport athlete in college. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was more uh, me being a jack of all trades, not being that special athlete that could do everything. You know, uh, I was I was fortunate. I went to a small school. the uh, The high school I went to was about two thousand students. The, high, the college I went to only had nine hundred students. Oh wow! And um, so I was a one of those guys who was just good enough to play on the basketball team as a you know as an off guard, and then. Um, I actually ended up being in a tennis PE class and, uh, you know, as a phys ed major and being taught by the tennis coach. And he came to the realization that he only had six guys for the season. If somebody got hurt, he didn't have enough. And so he thought I was just good enough to to run around the court and create havoc. And um, he ended up being one of my biggest mentors. So it was kind of a really cool, cool deal that he took me under his wing. And I actually got my first job in, um, I guess you'd say, administration of sport, running a national tournament on his behalf. I was kind of his number two for that. And, that was my uh, my senior year inter- or junior year internship with him, so it was kind of pretty cool that way. Yeah, and, yeah. and it was one more sport there you, you did just for re- yeah. I also played I played soccer one year. I had an injury with football, couldn't play on the uh, football team with a neck injury, didn't get cleared, and was able to go play goalie on the soccer team for a year. And um, that definitely taught me some things that there's a lot of differences between sports. And you know, I, I took some of the training from there. Um, you know, the way they did some of their cardio training, and that made me a better athlete in football the next two years when I did get cleared. So it was a pretty cool experience. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to ask you next was you know, all, all these different sports. You know, obviously football was kind of your main thing and it's continued to be your main thing. But how were you able to take, you know, that, that change of direction from tennis? Uh, you know, like you said, uh, some, some some endurance and, and cardio type training from these other sports and, and, and apply it to, to your game in football. Yeah, I mean, when I first got into coaching uh, back at Glenville State, I was the D-line coach and the strength and conditioning coach. And so some of our strength and conditioning got a little bit more creative than what you were seeing in the you know traditional 16 110s and doing all that kind of stuff, which was the standard back then. Right. And uh, we were able to take some more drills, um, especially in terms of tempo. And I think that was one of the things that probably served us as the team started to become no huddle offense in the early 2000s and, and not you know, just huddle up and three yards and run ISO on first down, run ISO on set, you know, power on second down, and then, you know, verbal pass on third down. Um, we were more conditioned for that. I think the use of 
um, other implements, you know, with something. And then I think now where I've still continued to steal from them is, you know, the, the GPS monitoring of our athletes for their reps and stuff like that it really came out of soccer more than it did football. Um, you know, trying to prevent soft tissue injuries and getting that recovery. And so I think that there was um, just some things that I got early on from those other sports that I brought into the strength and conditioning more than anything else. And um, I always, it's kind of this, the believe in liberal arts education, you know, you take a very broad base of everything while you get really good at one thing and you, but you, the approach you take from those other areas really helps you. Um, and so I think that was some of the stuff I used for sure. Well, you've been a multi-sport athlete and then you see an importance of it uh, from, from a training aspect and, from a skill aspect, how has how that molded maybe some of your recruiting? I know that's always a popular topic, uh, the, you know, the recruiting of the multi-sport athlete. You know, how, how, how do you personally approach that that topic in regards to your recruits? Yeah, we want multi-sport athletes as much as we can find them. We think that that's a, a bigger indicator of their growth potential. I, I think that a lot of times, you know, somebody who's already only played football for the last four years of high school and focused on 365, um, you know, they don't grow. They're about as good as they're going to get. And to me, those guys who go and play basketball, go and play, you know, run track, play baseball, whatever it might be, they have more ability to grow when they get here. But they've also been coached by a lot of different voices. And I think one of the things that happens to those guys that play one sport, you know, you have that same high school coach, that same position coach for all four years. When you go to college, it's hard to hear a different voice, a different temperament, a different tone because you've only known one way. And now you get there and, you know, if you've got those multi-sport guys, the basketball coach might have coached completely different than the football coach. Or the baseball coach is completely different. And that allows that adjustment to that college relationship and new personality. Um, I would love to tell you that recruiting is 100% pure and the relationship you form with the coach is going to be exactly the same when they're coaching you. But as soon as you give up a deep post and the deep third, that, that personality is going to change real quick. That's right. And so I, I think that ability to be coached differently and, and be more coachable is something they get by playing multiple sports as well. Yeah, and this is always an interesting time to have this 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 conversation. Obviously, the draft just ended here this past weekend, and and, and you start seeing the tweets that go out, the 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 big infographic of how many of those draft picks were multi sport athletes, and it's typically around ninety five percent of these guys play in multiple sports. Now, I do we got to ask you this question? You might not have an answer for it, and if you don't, that's fine. But is, is there any particular sport that you see, and it kind of, you know, you get a little bit more excited about it? You know, oh, this guy wrestles, or this guy play basketball. Is there any sport that's that secondary sport that gets you kind of? kind of fired up not real to be honest with you i like them all so yeah. i mean to me i guess the one that probably and this is a total bias from me growing up where i grew up in upstate new york i love guys that played lacrosse wow the you know, their awareness and field spacing um with the potential for contact it, it, it takes it to that next level beyond basketball and um soccer even because of the contact piece but there is so much space there that i think that's really helpful for defensive players in particular um Again, I'll take a track kid all day. I'll take a basketball kid. I'll take guys that played hockey, wrestlers. It doesn't matter to me. But lacrosse, that open field awareness. Um, you know, I always tell everybody, I'll, I'll go down swinging that the best football player to ever play the game was Jim Brown. Well, he was also a three-time All-American in lacrosse. And so there must have been something there that kind of, kind of, you know, put it together. Um, and so I just think that's one of those games that really – um, forces guys to to be in that spatial awareness that's unique to other sports. Absolutely, that that's really interesting. My my last year coaching before I took this job here at the AFC, I was at Davidson College. And that was about as far to the East Coast I'd ever really been. I'd really been in that deep South where lacrosse just isn't really a thing here, nor is I, ice hockey. And I remember I was I was recruiting in Ohio, and uh, you know I'm there in spring ball and. and and they're oh yeah he's he's in lacrosse and I'm like man what is this game here and uh it, tons of hand eye coordination like you said all, all the stuff you just mentioned it was really intriguing watching those guys and how many of those pretty much every high school I went to those guys were playing lacrosse so it seemed to be a lot of a lot of crossover from those two sports now um you know you you talked a little bit about your strength and conditioning background you're fully certified uh, uh and you know pretty decorated as a strength and conditioning coach but you've also coordinated on both sides of the ball uh offense and defense um you know do you have a preference i know you play defensive line and in, in in uh in college and all that kind of stuff and how does your coaching philosophy change depending on the side of the ball that you're on yeah i got to be honest with you I, i've only coached i've only coordinated on the offensive side for one year okay um fortunately we won a conference championship so i looked like i was a really smart coach in that moment but um i really enjoy the the, the defensive mindset of I'm not giving up an inch. And I feel like that's one of those things on the defensive side. It's a much more emotional freedom to play the game. Um, on offense, it felt much more cerebral to me, you know, that you're sitting back there. And though we were still emotional, 
it wasn't emotional in between plays. And I felt that on defense, sometimes you take it personal that they got three yards and all of a sudden you're dialing up a blitz because of that. And, uh, you know, but on offense, I would say that um, I really enjoyed the, the film breakdown on offense more than I did on defense. Um, and it was, it was a lot more enjoyable that way from looking at how teams could be exploited and things like that. So I, I enjoyed the offense a little bit better this year, but I'd say traditionally I'm still a defensive guy at heart. And I think bringing that approach to our offensive meeting room um, actually helped guys understand what defenses were trying to take away and how we were going to be able to exploit that. So I, I think that, again, that liberal arts background maybe gets me more well-rounded than it is you know, specific. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, you, you obviously have a lot of people early in their career that listen to this podcast. And, you know, oft, oftentimes they have an opportunity to maybe GA or take their first job on the opposite side of the ball. Just having so much of defense ex- experience and now being later on in your career having this offense opportunity. What, 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 what advice would you give in terms of maybe getting some experience early for a young guy? Yeah, I sit in the other room. Whatever you're doing, when you know when you're breaking down those scout team cards, go talk to the defensive guys. If you're an offensive coach, and find out exactly how they would teach the techniques, what they would expect, you know, how, maybe how they would change. It. And then again, flip side, if you're on a defense, go and ask the offense why they're doing what they're doing. Learn those whys during the off season. Um, I think that's one of the things I probably failed to do my first couple of years as a GA was I was so focused on being the best D line coach, and I was only going. I was talking to every D line coach in the country for drills. I was doing all that. Then I totally forgot to think about the linebackers and the DBs because that wasn't my, quote, job. Yeah. Um, but I think that that was one of the things I wish I would have done a little bit more, spend more time on the other side. That was something I kind of picked up later in my career that uh, that made me better on both sides, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, that, you know, I'm, I'm happy you kind of brought that up because, you know, D-line is one of those positions that's super interesting as far as uh, career pro- progression goes, and so is defensive back. And on the offensive side, the O-line and kind of receivers because it's very easy to get in those positions and – and not, you know, be a receiver coach and not really tap into what the O-line is doing or be a D-line coach and not have zero care what the cornerback is doing on on every play. So, you know, obviously you've been able to uh, be a defensive coordinator successfully for a while. How did you start tapping into that back end and really learning that that, that secondary? Yeah, so, I mean, it was uh, the guy that I was coaching with at Glenville State, uh, Paul Schaffner is a, a longtime defensive coordinator, and he really started to force us to learn – how things were interacting together. So for me, it started going to the linebackers. How do the linebackers and the defensive line, you know, yeah, I understood that the D-line had the B-gap, right? But I didn't understand how that impacted the linebackers. Um, and being in a 3-4 defense, there was a lot more interactiveness than there is maybe in a four-man front. And so he really forced that upon us. And then it wasn't until my second job at Wingate where the we met as a whole defensive staff. There wasn't, you know, the, the D-line coaches were going to do D-line stuff and the DB coaches were doing DB stuff. We met a lot more as a full staff, and um, to be honest, I'm not, not sure I should say this on an AFCA podcast, but it was over beers on Thursday nights with the DB coaches trying to figure out, you know, okay, why is this kid better than that kid? He's a better athlete, but he's a better corner. Explain to me why. Yeah. And that's how we would get kind of in the nuances of the technical piece more than just, I mean, I could drop cover three and I could drop cover two, but I couldn't tell you how to get off the hash and what foot placement, things like that. And those yeah. Thursday nights were kind of where we, we turned our focus to that. I love that, man. I mean, it, it, you kind of jokingly mentioned saying it on the podcast, but I mean, that, that isn't that what we do? I mean, we, we all meet down at that convention every year and have some beers and, and we just, you know, we talk, we, we talk ball and we talk philosophies. That's, that's awesome. You're able to do that development throughout the course of the, the year. And uh, that's helped you along in your career. Now transition a little bit to the success of your program uh, you know, that you've had thus far. You know, one of the quotes that I was able to pick up just kind of doing some homework here is uh, without preparation, there's not achievement, and this process is what we celebrate. And this is something that you were uh, that you said at some point. Talk a little bit about how you celebrate the process in your program and how that mindset has helped you be successful. Yeah, it's really about celebrating the value added by every individual and what they're doing. I mean, not every kid can be the All-American wide receiver, and not everybody can be the, the starter. I mean, we're going to have 22 starters. We're going to have 100-plus guys on the team. That means there's 80 guys that don't even get celebrated for being a starter on their team, much less anything else. And so – looking to see how they contribute and finding points, whether it's, you know, identifying that scout team player that did something great or identifying the guy who, you know, I get the email from, from a professor that this kid really stood out in class on Thursday in their participation, or, you know, one of the guys does something great on campus. We want to bring that to the front of everybody, you know, that's on the team so they can see it and then they can strive for those behaviors. Um, I also think that, you know, with us, we spend a lot of time with our guys like trying to help them find internships and things like that. And so as we're doing those things, 
letting them understand that it's not a one phone call situation to get you the, the deal that sometimes you got to have 14 rejections to get the job you want. And, you know, especially if they ever want to get into coaching, that's going to be the case. And so um, looking at that process of getting themselves prepped so that when their moment is called, their time is called, they're ready. Um, I, I think that's something that will always be important for us. And, um, you know, if you celebrate the process, you know, even if the result doesn't get you what you want, everybody feels like it was a worthwhile endeavor. And, and so that's something that we work with our guys to be really intentional about um, making sure that our players are, um, you know, excited about that daily grind. Because again, we, we trained for, you know, nine month off season for 10 games. And after those 10 games, nothing's guaranteed. And so uh, I think for our guys to have that understanding and, and appreciate that time in the weight room and, and enjoy it, that's the other part. You got to enjoy it, not just celebrate it. Um, you know, that to me is really special. Well, you've had some very special moments. Uh, you know, you've broken or tied 124 uh, records um, over the, the last 12 seasons and in this last five year stretch. You've been 32 and 11, uh, best best five year stretch uh, in, in almost 70 years. What do you attribute some of the success to, and how does, how does this kind of tie into that mantra of the you know the focus on that process? Yeah, 18 year olds who said yes in recruiting. Uh, those were guys that made our program a lot better. Yeah. Um, you know, a good group of coaches that have been with me for a long time. I mean, our defensive coordinator and I, we joke sometimes in recruiting, we've been together longer than we've been with our wives. And I think that helps. You know, we were, we got together in 2008. I didn't get married till 2009. So I think that's, you know, kind of a difference there. <laughs> um, and I think that that's just one of those things that consistency of approach. Um, players walk into the building every single day, they walk out to practice, they know what they're going to get. It's not going to be a, you know, a bipolar coaching approach by us. They're going to see exactly what, you know, they expect. Um, and I think I learned a lot of lessons making mistakes. You know, I mean, one of the things that's kind of fortunate at the Division three level, maybe not at the Division one level, is you can have a couple of bad years early and not be fired. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, when you look at our, our record those first couple of years when I took over as head coach, I mean, we won seven games in the first three years. Yeah. In the last three seasons, we've won seven games each season at least. So, to me – yeah, we were able to make some of those mistakes and figure out what didn't work. Um, you know, this week I was with, you know, Coach Clawson from Wake Forest. And um, we were talking about how in our first jobs, him at Fordham, me at, you know, Lake Forest, how many mistakes we made, even though we thought we knew everything. You know, we all have that running tab of all the things we would do differently if we became head coaches. And I tried to implement them all at once and quickly realized why previous coaches weren't implementing that. Yeah. Um, and so you know, I thought it was the right thing to do. It, it wasn't the right thing for us at that time. And, um, you know, I think that's part of it. And then, again, like I said, the players we have are, are pretty special right now. We've been, we've been fortunate. So good recruiting made us, made us better. We grew our roster. When I took over in 20, 2009, we had uh, 62 guys on the roster. We've got 110 now, so we can practice a lot different. We can, we can go through drills a lot different. I think that helps. Absolutely. Now, uh, you, you mentioned those, those first three years uh, uh, as the head coach and, and some of the, the lumps that you had to take along the way. How, how do you, early in your career, when you are taking some of those uh, uh, lumps there, how are you able to self-assess and say, you know what, this is what's working, this isn't what's working? Do you lean on other other people, other coaches that you trust in the business? Or, you know, where, where, where did you go personally? Yeah, I actually had two coaches. You know, I flew them in to come see us during our season uh, that third year. And um, they were currently out of work at that time, but they had been pretty successful coaches in the past and were just taking kind of, we'll call it a sabbatical. Um, you know, while they're trying to figure out their next step. And I said, they'd come in for three days and they had access to everything. They went to meetings, they watched practice, they watched film. And I said, you know, I think I'm doing the right things, but you know, I'm a little gun shy right now. Come in and tell me what you think. And, you know, the both of them came in, gave us some great feedback. Um, there were a couple areas that they thought should really be addressed that they were like, look, you do it your way. But if I had this going on and when they both said the same thing, it allowed us to, to focus on some different things as the coaching staff and keep moving it forward. Um, and again, after they, that next year, ironically, you know, we, we win those seven games in three years. And then the next year we win the conference championship. And so I'm not saying that those two weeks, but we called all these different people, got a little bit different things, um, changed our philosophies a little bit on offense and defense, both. Um, you know, and I think that kind of worked. And again, we just, uh, those small victories, you know, being, I always tell everybody the most turning point of our program was losing a game but it was losing the game to the conference champion by six points when they had a guy that played eight years in the NFL at quarterback. And so, you know, we go in this high scoring game, we lose to them, but that was where our team gained their confidence. They could be that competitive team um, as opposed to, you know, just another loss on the board. Uh, man, that, uh, I, I love the story that 
you were able to reach out to guys and have, I would assume, tough conversations. You know, uh, as the head guy in charge, and especially it's been such an egotistical type of sport, <laughs> you know, this manly man type of sport to where – it's hard to maybe hear the truth and, and, and let alone take it and implement it. So, uh, you know, hats off and kudos to you for, for you know, reaching out to, to somebody else and then, and, and, you know, embracing their feedback. Um, now, before I let you go here, Coach, I know you got to get back to it. Uh, you served on the AFCA's Board of Trustees since 2019. Uh, obviously in Arizona with, with the AFCA, with the coaching staff, uh, excuse me, with a, a bunch of the board and, and uh, our, our director here, uh, Todd Berry. Can you talk a little bit about why that role uh, was important for you to pursue and, and, and what it's done for your career? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was just – it's protected the game of football. And we've been under, you know, scrutiny, whether it was early on with the concussion stuff that had impacts or whether it was the way, you know, coaches were addressing players, whatever it might be. And now it's transfer portals and NILs. And, and I felt that the Division three coaches needed a voice in the room. Yeah. And, um, you yeah, know, that was something I thought that was important, somebody who'd been around a lot of different things and, you know, I've been on the Sports Science Committee Institute for the NCAA for about five or six years and have been the chair for the Division Three championships. Uh, but the, that's for the whole NCAA. Within the AFCA, that's our coaches. That's the, the guys who are really doing it on a daily basis. Um, and I, I think that one of the great things is you look at a number of the coaches that are on the board of trustees, they have various backgrounds, whether it's James Franklin being a Division Two guy as a player at Edinburgh or yeah. Dave Clawson playing Division Three at Williams and their coaching backgrounds have been all over the place. You know, Coach Pittman from Arkansas is a Division II guy. And so, to me, you know, you get all these guys in a room and the egos do go away. And I think that's one of the best parts about the Board of Trustees is that it doesn't matter what school you're at. It doesn't matter what your bank account says. It's about how much you care about the game of football, how much thought have you put into it, and can we all learn a little bit from each other to make the game better. And I really do believe that's the, the way the AFC truly operates. And, you know, getting those young coaches involved, um, I was fortunate. I was on a couple of committees. You know, I was on the the summer manual committee, and I was on a couple other ones growing up. And then, next thing you know, I was on the on the board of trustees. And so, a little bit different responsibilities on this one, but they're they're awesome, man. And I think that each one of us as coaches, you know, we we sometimes remember what football did for us and what we're trying to do for others, but we also got to remember that the game has to be protected and you know continually improved in any way that we can. And so, I, I thought that being on the board that was my focus. It's what you know I've kind of seen since I've been on it. Absolutely, and, and you said something super important. I, I know I said I'll let you go, but I do want to follow up on that, and, and, and I'll let you go here. Uh, you, you mentioned you want to be that D3 voice, and, you know, especially right now, I know this is the topic, the hot topic of the day, but, you know, you, you went through and you talked about concussions. You talked about some of the other things that, that have happened here in the past. Right now, NIL and, and uh, the, the transfer portal is, is kind of the hot topic, and, and the forward-facing part, the part that your average Joe sees on, on TV, it's – it's Penn State, it's University of Texas, it's Florida, it's these power five schools. But obviously, this whole thing is affecting everybody from top to bottom. How are you, you know, what, what are some of the effects of the one-time transfer in the NIL? Uh, you know, what are you seeing at the Division three level? Yeah, the one-time transfer is opening up a, a lot of opportunity for guys to go and re, reboot their system. You know, I, I use this kind of the old Nintendo where you pull it out, you blow on it, slam that thing back in there, try to get to work. I feel like that's kind of what's happening for a lot of guys. You know, they, they're chasing that Division one. Um, BCS preferred walk on and things like that. And then they're realizing that's not the life they're about. And um, now they're getting a chance to go be re-recruited, if you will. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's awesome. I don't, I don't think it's great that there's almost 8,000 guys in the transfer portal. Cause that means a lot of guys picked the wrong school. Uh, but I, I do think it does give that student athlete a better chance to, to go find success and enjoyment. And uh, to me, that part I enjoy. Now the, the free agent shopping of some of those elite players that are just looking for the better NIL deal. I don't particularly like that, but I, I've always, I've always appreciated when a guy goes from a division one to a division two school or a division one to do division three school and actually enjoy themselves more. And, and I, I think that as I've watched a lot, the landscape of the last six months in college athletics, we've unfortunately lost some of our elite athletes to suicide. And I think that if they can find a place where there's that better balance and that better mental health space for them, and it's at a lower, you know, a, a smaller level of football in a better environment, then let's let them have that opportunity. I, I do think the one-time transfer is valuable. The NIL, to be honest with you, for Division Three, we're not seeing a whole lot of that yet. Okay. I don't know if anybody's signing big contracts in Division Three, but if they do, um, you know, I will they talk there. There are people that are setting that up so we can get it for our players. So I'm all for it. <laughs> if our guys get a free slice of pizza because they play for me, I'm good with it. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, Coach, I sure appreciate uh, you know hopping on with me here, and I also appreciate, as I mentioned before, what you, what you do here for the AFCA and uh, represent that Division Three in the in the Board of Trustees meetings, and uh, you know just everything you do for our great game. So thanks thanks a lot, Coach, and uh, go enjoy the rest of Arizona. Appreciate it, Merle. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Inside the Headset. If you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about, head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes. While you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at afca.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at we are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.